Money is the measure of many things. It's the measure of value. It's the measure of status. It can be the measure of power. Money is just an easy way to facilitate transactions. Money, if I have it right, is that commodity which is readily exchangeable for any other commodity. That's money. I've got bread, I want your wine, but you want the butcher's meat. Money allows people who have wildly disparate wants to produce and then trade with people. Money is what facilitates that trust between strangers. Money is what we use to decide how much to save, how much to spend, which means everyone has to have faith in it. Money is only useful if at least two people agree that it can be trusted. Money is all trust. They don't care whether it's a pirate, whether it's a king. Trust is essential because that's what money is. But lately, there have been signs that something has happened to this trust. People are worrying about their money and the future more than in the past. The declining value of the dollar has greatly affected people. The truth is many Americans feel their money isn't going where it could, their household is kind of short. But it's not just money that people are afraid to trust. Studies are showing trust in society, institutions, in government is lower than ever before. How did we get here? Why is there less trust in money, in society, and in each other? The answer lies in understanding the one thing that both unites us and divides us, money. The notion that money is the root of all evil, of course, is drawn from a biblical passage, but it's slightly distorted because in the writings of Paul, he refers to the love of money as the root of all evil. No one in the Bible, to my knowledge, ever says that money itself is evil. In the major media today, money is often portrayed in a negative light. But in fact, money being a medium of exchange, makes possible a level of commerce that wouldn't otherwise take place. Money is first a measure of value. Uh, the way a scale measures weight, a ruler measures space, a clock measures time, money measures the value of products, services, investment devices. So it has to be fixed in value. And to see the proof of it, all you have to do is take time. Time is a fixed measure, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. Imagine if that floated each day. So you have 50 minutes an hour one day, 80 minutes the next. We know intrinsically that would make life chaotic, much more difficult. Changing the value of money destroys trust between buyer and seller, lender and borrower, because it changes the values that were agreed upon. One party got an undeserved gain, the other got an undeserved loss. By providing a mutually agreed upon measure of value, money in ancient times created trust between strangers that allowed more trade to take place. When the first coins were made in Lydia, they were made with this mixture of silver and gold called electrum. And that item itself was something that people trusted. People wanted these precious metals. They could use them for all types of things. Money began to change every aspect of life. Money made it possible for people to think in new ways. Everything was now being numbered. So it begins to create a kind of mobility in people's lives that they never had before. Markets created by money expanded commerce and culture. So what we saw in Athens is you have a marketplace and then you have all kinds of ancillary activities going on around it. And so you have the philosophers, for example, who are meeting along the edges of the market. And so you have the first real development of philosophy in the Western world. By increasing trust between lender and borrower, sound money gave rise to the development of credit and finance. 
The link between money and trust, I think that there is evidence linguistically that the original Latin word for trust is credere, which is the root of the word credit. And so when you take on credit, effectively the person lending to you is trusting that you're going to pay back that credit. You are credit worthy, i.e. you are trust worthy. The real beneficiary of money, the imperial beneficiary, was Rome. Our word today, mint, came from the temple of Minerva because the money was being created there. And often in the early days, gods were portrayed or divine symbols were portrayed on the money, again as a way of protecting the money and giving it a certain aura that was going to be sacred to keep people from violating it. This sacred trust was violated by the Roman Emperor Nero who introduced Rome to the practice of debasement. They would call in all the coins, all gold, all silver coins, melt them down, reissue them, of course, with his picture on them or his imprint of his profile on them, but he would reduce the silver and the gold by 10%. That way, he would be 10 to 15% richer, depending on the coin. And you can really follow the history of Rome through the money. That Rome's decline was very closely associated with the decline of its money. The rise of the modern financial economy began in the medieval period. One of the early developments was the Knights Templar, which was a religious order of knights. And one of the things they did was to protect pilgrims as they did a pilgrimage among the cathedrals of medieval Europe, visit various cathedrals. The Knights Templar developed a system where he said, well, you can just deposit your money here with us, and then when you need some, you can withdraw it from your account. This enabled the peasants to travel Europe without being a danger of being robbed. And so the Knights Templar became one of the early banking institutions. Pretty soon the Italian banks took this many levels further. Already by the 12th century, banking was re-emerging in Italy and got quite sophisticated by the era of the Renaissance. The Italian invention of double-entry bookkeeping and their use of paper money led to an explosion of trade and wealth, ushering in the Renaissance. But it was the Dutch who advanced the world's understanding of how the power of sound money can be leveraged through the skillful use of credit. They established the Bank of Amsterdam, which didn't actually have its own coinage, but maintained a, a stable unit of account. And so Amsterdam became the first modern financial center of Europe. There was this uh, company called the Dutch East Indies Company, which managed trade with Asia, with China. And it grew big enough that they ended up with shares in the company, and these shares were traded in the world's first modern stock exchange. And they developed a derivatives market, a futures market for commodities, and of course, many banks. And as a result, the seemingly resource-poor speck of Europe became one of the global empires, became the financial center of the world. One of the important things in England's rise was first that it created a currency that other people could trust, not just the English people themselves. Well, the best mechanism for this would be some kind of commodity that's permanent, easily transported, easily understood by everyone, shared as a value by everyone, and that medium was, of course, gold. And gold then became the central focus of the monetary system. In 1689, the Dutch Prince William of Orange ascended to the British throne. Under William, the Bank of England, modeled on the Bank of Amsterdam, was established in 1694. At the end of the 17th century, Britain had been reasonably successful, but not a center of finance the way Holland and Amsterdam had become. Part of the reason is that the silver coinage was very low quality, it had been heavily worn. Many of the coins had lost 20, 30% of their, of, their, of their contained silver. This centuries-old practice of debasing the currency, however, was meeting with resistance. In the great recoinage debate of 1696, the philosopher John Locke argued against the government's proposal to remint British coins at a lower value. It will be a loss and impoverish a great and innocent part of the people who, having their estates in money, have as much right to make as much of their money as it is worth. The idea that you would arbitrarily change the value of money, that went against what Locke called natural law, violating our rights. When you change the value of money, you're stealing property without due process of law, without a commercial transaction. 
Locke eventually won the argument. Britain reminted its coins at their full value, a victory for sound money. Locke's friend and supporter was the famed mathematician Isaac Newton. As master of the British Mint, he pegged Britain's currency to a fixed value of gold. Isaac Newton established the principle of three pounds, 17 shillings, 10 pence per ounce of gold. At the time, it was just a minor bureaucratic adjustment, but this new value of the pound actually remained unchanged all the way up until 1931. So this great era of gold standard in Britain, of the ascendancy of British finance to become the financial capital of the world, and the ascendancy of the British Empire, we now trace back to some degree to that decision by Isaac Newton in 1717. During the late 18th century, a young American republic struggled to recover from the hyperinflation caused by the overprinting of continental dollars during the Revolutionary War. To save their new nation, the Founding Fathers created a financial system based on British ideas of sound money. I spent a lot of time reading Thomas Jefferson's note on the establishment of a money unit. It's wonderful handwritten notes that we have in the Library of Congress. And to see Jefferson writing out in this very concise way, what should be this new fledgling country? What should be our money unit? And there's a great line in those notes, handwritten. And he says, and if we determine that the dollar shall be our unit, then we must say with precision what a dollar is. And it was a specific weight of gold or silver. And he just felt that was imperative. And then that was enshrined in our founding documents in the same passage that talks about Congress shall define weights and measures, and they will define the money. Alexander Hamilton, appointed by George Washington as the first Secretary of the Treasury, created a financial system for the young U.S. Republic based on the ideas of John Locke and Adam Smith. Alexander Hamilton fixed the dollar to gold in the 1790s. The dollar became to be seen as a rock-solid currency where you could go anywhere in the world and they would accept that dollar. So you had massive flows of capital, massive flows of people, and the world boomed. By the second half of the 19th century, we have the period that's known as the classical gold standard era. And this was a time when all the world used gold as the basis of their currency. The era of the classical gold standard was a period of one of the greatest booms in the history of uh, humankind because you had stable money. The gold standard was not only a monetary system, it was, a, it was an entire system of thinking about finance. It was taken as rote that governments must balance their budgets, except in time of war, and then after the war is over, they should restore balance and pay down the debt. That was the idea. You could sell a bond in London and build a railroad in India. It was this extraordinary period of expansion in the Industrial Revolution, which was matched by technological uh, advances. Between 1870 and 1914, industrial production increased by five times, wages soared, the amount of farmland under production more than doubled. It was an incredible period of wealth creation for the United States. The interest rates of that time expressed a degree of trust that is almost unimaginable today. The buyer of a British console bond in 1870 could look back at a British pound that hadn't changed for nearly two centuries. Please don't get me wrong, there were examples of terrible deprivation and hunger, but it was a time of great material progress, and the monetary foundation of that progress uh, lay in the gold standard. The technology advances of the 19th century also brought disruption. Farmers who produced more found they couldn't charge as much for their crops. Many blamed the gold-based dollar, which they believed created a shortage of money. 
One of the big events in U.S. history, famous, was the 1896 presidential election when William Jennings Bryan, and he gave what was called the Cross of Gold speech. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. What he overlooked at the time was it wasn't gold or a sound dollar that was causing farmers' problems. It was overproduction. The real sign of distress was we kept having these um, uh, banking failures where money would be short and the banks would run out of currency, interest rates would shoot up, and every few years this would turn into a, a major depression. It just wasn't a very stable system. There were also uh, limits on how much uh, banks could lend. Calls for the establishment of a central bank to act as a lender of last resort increased after financier J.P. Morgan personally bailed out the banks during the Panic of 1907. 1907, you had the, the banking panic in New York, and the Knickerbocker Bank uh, went under, and it was spreading, so there was going to be a major banking crisis developing. J.P. Morgan, the financier, was in many ways our first central banker, but he was a private banker, very powerful and very influential, and called all the bankers together to his library up on Madison Avenue, and he invited him in the evening to, for dinner, and then after the dinner, he locked the doors, and he says, nobody's leaving here until we come up with a solution, and we start loaning money to other banks so that we can avoid this problem. You had a meeting at Jekyll Island in the early 1900s, and together they came up with the concept that was finally made into law in December of 1913. President Woodrow Wilson signed into effect the Federal Reserve Act. This act created the Federal Reserve System to provide a safer and more stable monetary and banking system. And the Federal Reserve was created with two goals in mind. One was to defend the gold standard, defend the dollar, and number two was to be a lender of last resort in case there was another 1907 type patty, because J.P. Morgan had died. In 1914, not long after the founding of the Federal Reserve, the Great War began. Whenever you have a great war, you have inflation. You do anything you can to get the resources to fight for what you think is your survival. So all the fighters, small countries, big countries, saw a debasement in the value of their currency. To print money to pay for the conflict, Europe and the U.S. went off gold. And after losing the war, Germany suffered the infamous Weimar hyperinflation. If you really want to understand how a system works, you should study it when it's really malfunctioning. Here's something that Lenin, Keynes, and von Mises all agreed with. Unstable money is the quickest way to turn the society upside down. The German example of the early 20s was a supreme uh, example of, of what happens when people cease to trust the medium of exchange. After World War I, we said to Germany, you have to pay back the world. That was called reparations, and we actually demanded too much. The nation's government certainly couldn't pay that much money, so Germany began to print, so to speak, and printed too much. The best known stories of inflation are things like you go to a restaurant and you find that your meal is going to cost 8,000 marks, say, and you order it, you eat it, and by the time the bill comes, that 8,000 marks has become 16,000 marks. With the value of their money collapsing, Germans bought houses, real estate, anything. People even bought pianos who couldn't play them. And it's just very interesting that the Weimar hyperinflation coincided with this great hedonism. The bars were absolutely packed. There's something very disorientating about hyperinflation. There is no future. You live for now. Because money was worthless, farmers, people who produced food, simply refused to sell it. What often happens with inflation is people look for someone to blame. And so in Germany in the 20s, the stores of Jews were the place where the windows were broken because people blamed the Jews for the money being worth nothing when actually it was the government of Germany that made the money worth nothing. As far as uh, Germany was concerned, 
democracy had been given its chance and people began to long for a strong man. The strong man who eventually came back, of course, in 1933 was Hitler. You can't say that the great inflation in Germany caused Hitler, but you can say it did cause the end of trust in democracy. In 1930, President Herbert Hoover signed into law the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. Its sweeping taxes on thousands of foreign products triggered a global trade war. This set in motion events leading to the Great Depression. With millions unemployed, governments searched for solutions. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nowadays, we take it as a rule that in a downturn, the money shouldn't tighten because looser money will help us get to recovery. In that period, the 1930s, they believed when a bank was in trouble, you should cut them off. And they tightened the money, and the country literally ran out of money. So in some towns, especially in the West, for example, in Utah, there was no money left. The bank closed. And what's very interesting is towns created their own money. Then they traded for agricultural goods at the store. Many looked to the activist policies of the British economist John Maynard Keynes. Keynes legitimized the view that economies are not intrinsically stable and that there is a role, therefore, of policy to offset whatever is destabilizing the economy. If the economy is weak, the central bank can lower interest rates and encourage bank lending and spending by the borrowers. If the economy is overheating, the central bank can do the opposite and raise interest rates. For the politicians of his day, Keynes came along at just the right time because he essentially said to them, what you're doing is just fine, just do more of it. Keynes hated the idea of a limitation on your ability to engage in easy money because it was the gold standard, according to Keynes and the Keynesians today, that caused the Great Depression because the countries couldn't engage in easy money. Under the influence of Keynes, in 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt, in an attempt to revive a struggling U.S. economy, confiscated private holdings of gold and devalued the dollar. And we had the emergency bank acts carried out by President Roosevelt. And one of them was to, with the swipe of a pen, diminish the value of the dollar in terms of its gold content. It represented a significant diminution of the dollar's gold value simply by lowering the exchange rate. I am going to establish a government market for gold in the United States. That also was accompanied by confiscation of monetary gold that people had. So all kinds of constitutional freedoms and this moral commitment to maintain the value of the money were swept out under what was considered emergency conditions. The great abuse of American trust that we always study comes in the 1930s. Roosevelt really didn't know what to do. He had a good will, but not much solid theory. So he kind of tried every theory, the way people will do, like a cook in a kitchen trying different spices. The decade-long malaise of the 1930s had given rise to a new era. Keynes's influence caused many economists to turn away from age-old thinking about money. They believed that central banks were needed to help keep the economy stable and blamed gold for prolonging the Great Depression. My view then is that the gold standard was a transmission belt for the Great Depression, and then when it finally collapsed, that collapse was a shock to confidence and expectations that worsened depression in the first instance, but did ultimately free up governments and central banks to take stabilizing action, which, with a delay, they did. But some economists say the downturn had other causes. It had nothing to do with lack of demand. The problem is that they raised taxes on January 1st, 1932. The highest marginal income tax rate went from, what was it, 25% to 63%? 
And then we instituted excise taxes across the board. We put in the death tax of only 90%. No one will die if they keep it up high enough. I'm not ready to go. There were enormous increases in domestic taxes, especially in the United States, Britain, and Germany, and many, many other things going on. You don't have to look at monetary forces alone to explain the Great Depression. Near the end of World War II, the Allied nations met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Their mission, to forge a monetary system that would end the competing currency devaluations that marked the trade wars of the 1930s. Delegates from 44 Allied and Associate countries arrived for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. During World War II, near the end, all countries decided what they call these beggar thy neighbor policies. I'll reduce the value of my money, try to get a short-term advantage. The other country responds, well, I'll reduce my money. What they call beggar thy neighbor ended up hurting everybody. So they wanted a system of fixed exchange rates. They wanted a new gold standard. Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary, issued a memo instructing his deputy to come up with some kind of a post-war system that would no longer be subject to the beggar thy neighbor tactics that had caused the world to descend into the economic chaos. United States Treasury Secretary Morgenthau addresses the meeting. To be discussed are plans for the stabilization of world currencies. It ended up in a debate between John Maynard Keynes, who was the intellectual guru of the time, and which everybody at that point was viewing as knowing everything. On one side of the debate, there were people who thought that currencies should be manipulable by the government, and their values should change, and they should manage interest rates, and they should manage the macroeconomy. And on the other side, there was the idea that, no, we want gold standard system that worked so well for so many years. Our experiments with floating currencies in World War I in the late 1930s were failures, and we don't want that, so we're going to have gold standard system. Keynes eventually lost the argument. Under the Bretton Woods Agreement, the world returned to gold-based money. Ours is a mission of peace, not just lip service to the ideals of peace, but action designed to establish the economic foundations of peace on the bedrock of genuine international cooperation. So right around 1949, 1950, this new world gold standard system emerged. And it was enormously successful. Those two decades from 1950 to 1960 were the most successful economically of any time from 1914 to the present. All around the world, you had these fantastic economic performance indicators. And it is amazing to me that people don't see that this era of fantastic growth coincided perfectly with the era during which the world had a fixed exchange rate system. The decade of the 1960s brought new challenges. The U.S. was waging war in Vietnam. Washington looked for ways to fund the conflict and the social programs of the great society. Facing a mild recession at the start of his term in office, President Richard Nixon decided that the gold standard could no longer be sustained. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The proximate cause of the end of the Bretton Woods era was Richard Nixon apparently wanted to get reelected in 1972, and there had been a recession in 1970, and it just happened to coincide with the end of the term of William Martin, who was the head of the Federal Reserve. So Nixon said, well, let's put in my guy. He'll give me the easy money solution, get the printing presses rolling, we'll get the economy fired up, and I'll be a big winner in 1972 ran the printing presses, and in fact, they were actually quite successful, and Nixon was a winner. When we abandoned fixed exchange rates and the gold standard, 
then I think that in the short run, what people saw was that the standard had been abandoned because the US was prepared to tolerate higher inflation rather than finance the Vietnam War through increasing taxes. What happened fundamentally is the rest of the world grew up. <laughs> in the 50s, obviously coming out of the war, the United States was king. And other countries were rebuilding after the war. By the end of the 60s and the 70s, they rebuilt. And they became very competitive. Uh, we were spending a lot of money on troops abroad, a lot of foreign investment. We were spending a lot of dollars overseas. And those dollars came back, and uh, they had the right to exchange the dollars for gold. I see no reason why Bretton Woods ever ended. People talk about the monetary crisis of the 1960s. Oh, Bretton Woods was really aging, was on the downswing in the 1960s. It was about to crack up. Huh, that's an interesting idea in that the United States was growing at 5% per year. Unemployment was going to basically structural or zero. Japan was growing at 10% per year. West Germany at 8% per year. And even France and Italy growing at 6% per year. Where's the crisis? I mean, everyone's doing great. I was in the Treasury and the Secretary for Monetary Affairs when we went off gold. Treasury in the United States went to all kinds of extraordinary means of preserving the stability of the fixed exchange rate. But it was considered not just an economic issue, but a moral issue. The United States dollar was at the center of the system. We, in effect, pledged implicitly or explicitly the stability of the dollar upon which the entire system rested. And by the time we got to the end of the 60s, the imbalances were great enough, and finally that system broke down. And we tried to put it back together again, and we found it unable to do so. And the result was, the emergence of the floating currency system that we have today, and also the stagflation of the 1970s. With money no longer anchored to gold, the value of the dollar plunged. The Nixon shock may have successfully propped up the economy to help the president win re-election, but as with all devaluations, the boost was short-lived. We had very high inflation in the late 70s and 80s. 25% a year in Britain, 13% a year plus in the United States. Certainly the inflation in the 1970s was very costly. It was very costly while it was happening, and then it was very costly to correct and it represented a failure on the part of central banks around the world to understand some basic principles about printing too much money leading to higher prices. What makes countries inflate? The government spends, but they can't finance the spending by taxing people or issuing bonds in the international private market or domestic private market. So what do they do? They issue the bonds to the central bank. The fiscal authorities go into the central bank, they have bonds in one hand and a pistol in the other hand, and they say, turn on the printing press and buy this stuff, it's a great deal. The mood at the time, that there was just a feeling of inability to move constructively in any direction, and domestic policy or international policy, because inflation was looming. The inflation rate is 7%, still too high, but it illustrates very vividly that in addition to providing an enormous number of jobs, nine million new jobs in the last three and a half years, that the inflationary threat is still urgent on us. The 70s is often referred to as sort of the morning after of the 60s, and it did have that drunken morning after feel because things didn't play out as people expected. So you bought a house in 1962 at a 4 or 5% mortgage rate and it cost $32,000 and by the end of the 70s you'd like to sell it for 90 that sounds like a lot but 90 doesn't turn out to buy you the house you want next. Commodity prices soared including most notably the price of oil. Oil went crazy. It went all the way up to $40 a barrel from $3 a barrel, a 14-fold increase. As the United States maintained throughout the 1970s, we have no interest in returning to the gold standard. OPEC and the Arab oil embargo got most of the blame for the energy crisis of the 1970s. But the crisis really started with the devalued dollar. The clear message I received in the election campaign is that we must gain control of this inflationary monster. 
Finally, Fed Chairman Paul Volcker killed inflation by tightening the supply of money and drastically raising interest rates. Interest rates were way up above our expectations or anybody's expectations, and we had a lot of opposition. Well, you know, the farmers were objecting, the home builders were objecting, and so forth. The average citizen didn't know all about monetary policy and all the rest, and they knew things were pretty tough and interest rates were very high. It ain't the mood of the country. is somebody got to do something. Give them a chance. Volcker's strategy worked. In the early 1980s, inflation and the energy crisis ended. Oil promptly crashed to 20 and then $12 a barrel, stayed there for 18 years. Gold went down to $350 an ounce. The dollar was stable. There was a tremendous rush of investment out of those hedges into the real economy, 40 million new jobs. Zurich, 23, Citibank. 15-fold increase in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Volcker's stable dollar policies were continued by his successor, Alan Greenspan, into the late 1990s. The 20 years of stable money were known as the Great Moderation. Investment and lower trade barriers fueled prosperity that lasted into the new century. Like the era of the classical gold standard, the Great Moderation was a time of innovation. Lower interest rates and sound money unleashed a flood of capital that financed the high-tech revolution. Then, in the late 1990s, a rash of internet startups was hit by a shakeout, the dot-com bust. The Fed and the Treasury Department began to weaken the dollar. We went into a little recession in 2001. The Fed got scared and the Treasury got scared, so they made monetary policy flexible to fight that forgotten recession in 2001. With demand for dollars dropping in the sagging economy, the excessive printing of money created a level of oversupply not seen since the inflationary 1970s. This set off a wave of distortions that tore through the financial markets and the broader economy. When you devalue the currency, invariably there's a flight into hard assets. Housing is a great asset during an inflation simply because it's least vulnerable to the currency's devaluation, and better yet, you can live in it. When you have this kind of unstable money, not just in the United States, but around the world, it, like the virus in the computer, corrupts the information about prices. The average price of houses doubled in the 2000s in the context of stagnant economic growth, if you look at the Case-Shiller Index. Cheap money meant easy loans, often to people who would have normally been considered credit risks, so-called subprime borrowers. And they thought that mortgages was the safest form of lending. So you had people with very low incomes buying four or five houses, figuring I could make money in a perpetual motion machine of housing prices always going up and up. Banks fueled the mania, pumping money into the mortgage market by selling bonds that were packages of outstanding mortgages. There was an enormous credit boom and securitization boom in the five plus years leading up to the crisis. When the Fed raised interest rates, millions of homeowners could no longer afford their mortgages. The housing bubble exploded. The reason that this family have ended up here is due to large debt, larger than the value of their house. As we're getting ready to move and we said, where's our equity? She said, there's nothing left. So we ended up with nothing and on the street. We were suddenly in a situation where the banks were not lending. Firms with investment projects were finding it more difficult to borrow, and households were not spending. Throughout 2008, some of banking's biggest institutions teetered near collapse. The federal government bailed out mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Then in September, the venerable Wall Street firm Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Hundreds of uh, employees coming out with their boxes, paintings, umbrellas. The stock market crashed. Investors are pulling out, hedge funds pulling out. Their fear is we don't know how many more banks will fail. After the panic subsided, George Bush's successor, Barack Obama, in an attempt to halt the downturn, persuaded Congress to pass $800 billion in emergency government spending. 
the Federal Reserve embarked on the controversial program of monetary expansion known as quantitative easing. QE was an unprecedented expansion of the money supply, accompanied by zero interest rates. It was to deliver a massive Keynesian stimulus to an ailing economy, but that's not what happened. Stocks and bond prices boomed, but the economy did not. We did have a gigantic $800 billion fiscal stimulus in 2009, but if you're a Keynesian economist, you would say, too short and too small. But others believed the real problem was the monetary expansion engineered by the Fed. Why would anyone believe that the Federal Reserve borrowing $4 trillion from banks and proceeding to buy up mortgages and U.S. Treasuries, why would anyone believe that that would power economic growth? In fact, very little of the QE money was making it into the economy. Job-creating businesses in need of money during the crisis were not getting loans. Over the last several years, the too big to fail, too many jobs lost, too many homes they lost. came in with Dodd-Frank, which required capital ratios of banks to go up. All these things forced banks to shrink their emission of credit and be more stingy with credit. What happened in this country was a great deal of these trillions were locked up in inert accounts at the Federal Reserve, and they're called bank reserves. And these are dollars that might as well be in deep freeze. They didn't circulate. The elephant in the room were the commercial banks that were being squeezed, and credit was being squeezed. So, so that's one of the big reasons why the Great Recession just drug on forever. And I mean, only now we're really recovering from the thing. One percent took home 20 percent of the nation's income last year. The average worker barely saw a raise. It ain't fair. It ain't right. Not everyone suffered financially during the Great Recession. You know, one of the unhappy symptoms of that period was the extent of money that was being made in Wall Street. At one point, almost 40 percent of all the profits in American companies was made by financial firms. Are financial firms really worth 40% of the whole economy? Are they really producing that the result? I don't think so. <laughs> How do you feel if you're willing to take the risk to be a small business owner, you're trying to deliver a good consumer product, you're doing everything right, and then you see that it can be inflated away, or you see that people who went into pure finance are making bundles, or they're just sitting on their investments and watching the market go up. The debasement of money absolutely compromises the sense of justice and the, and the sense of fairness. So you naturally are driving a wedge effectively between the haves and, and the have-nots, and you then breach the trust. So you get the Occupy Wall Street movement, maybe you get Brexit, you know, you start to get a disillusionment with elites. And I think that that is playing out in all sorts of different um, arenas right now. We are 99%. People have less trust in money today than they did before the great financial crisis of 2008. Well, those were shocking events that occurred in response to a shocking financial crisis. And I think they did raise questions in people's minds about the reliability of the monetary and financial system. And the real expression of that, in my view, has been the surprising popularity of Donald Trump and his elections. He was not from the class that had run 2008. The same, by the way, with Bernie Sanders. Let's take this fight to the White House. Thank you all. Two people who didn't have anything to do with 2008 or the management thereof were the surprise figures in the recent election. Today, many people are questioning our financial system and its assumption. Can a central bank successfully guide an economy by manipulating money? I don't think the Fed is able to fine-tune the economy in a month-to-month -month or quarter-to-quarter 
or even year-to-year -year sense. But I think asking the Fed to be broadly stabilizing, touch their foot to the brakes by raising interest rates, I think that's a broadly appropriate mandate for the Fed. After all, the Fed fulfills an important role by keeping the economy from overheating, or does it? An economy can't overheat. Let's never forget that an economy is a collection of individuals. Can an individual overheat by doing better and better every year? Are individuals limited to 3% growth because if they get to five, they'll overheat? And don't we need to devalue the dollar to gain a trade advantage over certain nations? The idea of mercantilism never really gone away is the idea that you, you, you get rich by running a trade surplus in the old days by accumulating gold. I run a trade deficit with my favorite restaurants, my favorite clothiers, my favorite car makers, and with my landlord. I run a trade surplus with those who employ me. Trade deficits are the reward for production. So the floating currency era has now existed since 1971. The value of the dollar, which was $35 an ounce from 1934 to 1971, uh, stabilized in the 1980s around $350 an ounce. So compared to its traditional benchmark, it lost 90% of its value. People aren't starving in the street, but we do have a stagnation that persists and is very alarming. And I think that this is the great challenge of our time. You have this rise of financialization. Everybody's shuffling existing assets rather than creating new assets. These increasingly meaningless currencies get exchanged, you know, at the rate of $5.1 trillion every 24 hours. There's enormous amounts of money flow to the speculators and the hedge fund operators. You know, I think it has a deleterious effect on the economy, hurting classical investment that creates jobs. Thanks to floating money, we have taken all these great minds and forced them into facilitator roles as currency traders. Are they necessary? Yes. But imagine what we've lost because we removed all these great minds from productive ideas and forced them into trading the chaos wrought by weak and unstable money. Ten years after the panic of 2008, America has yet to face another serious financial crisis. But many nations around the world today are grappling with severe inflation. In Venezuela, the annual rate now exceeds 60,000 percent. It's just a, a scramble. Day-to-day -day living is very tough. I mean, the, the economy is just shutting down. Part of civilization is having trust in your government, and I think it's the government's responsibility to maintain that trust, and part of that trust is maintain honest money. And honest money, in my view, it means a stable purchasing power over a period of time. But how do you define stability? Economists at the Federal Reserve say it means maintaining a rate of 2% annual inflation. They cite an idea known as the Phillips Curve. The Phillips curve posits that if inflation goes up, unemployment must go down. If unemployment goes up, then inflation must go down. By my count, there have been seven Nobel Prizes awarded for economists who have disproven the Phillips curve. I must say that idea of a 2% inflation target grates on my ears. Once you begin aiming at 2%, then you hear people say, well, Maybe we can give the economy a little more juice by going to 3%. Or oh, if that doesn't work, we'll go to 4%. Others call for a new approach. Some believe the future lies in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is both a currency and a payment system. So it's like PayPal and US dollars combined into one. It's the means of transferring the money from one person to another. So Bitcoin has become a huge lifeline for people who are starving in Venezuela, enabling them to purchase goods from overseas. Well, I mean, Venezuela, there's just a huge number right. of people using these cards to try to find more Bitcoin. Remember, this is one of the least functional markets I've ever seen. Don't have a lot of supply. People don't understand how supply comes in. If you remember Buenos Aires in 2011 or 2012 on the street of Buenos Aires, that people say cambio, cambio. Now they say Bitcoin, Bitcoin. You show a proof of transaction that you send to that over-the-counter trader 
your Bitcoin and they give you cash of the local currency. The trouble is that I find myself very difficult to trust a currency like that unless I understand it. And I certainly am not confident that either the originators of it or indeed someone else hacking into it couldn't somehow drastically increase the supply of the currency by some factor of a same million with a big ha-ha appearing on my screen when I discover that my holdings have been devalued by a very large percentage. Think about it. Can we transact with Bitcoin today? Oh, I'll pay you 20 Bitcoin if you come to work for me. That will be your annual salary. Was it the Bitcoin that was worth 980 at the beginning of 2017 or the Bitcoin that was worth 22,000 when 2018 began. What's a mystery is why cryptocurrencies haven't striven to achieve the one purpose of money, which is stability. The euro, which allows European countries to escape the confusion of floating currencies, was considered a sound money alternative when introduced 20 years ago. Critics of the euro, however, point to troubled nations like Greece and worry that a common currency alone isn't enough. One way people describe Europe's plight is that monetary union, in order to work smoothly, requires banking union, a single supervisor, fiscal union, federal budget, and political union. In Europe, they have monetary union. They now have half a banking union, having started to build one in 2012, 2013. But they don't have a fiscal union or a political union, and there's no prospect of those on the horizon. Others say the only way to restore trust is for the United States to return to the system that worked for most of its history. The best solution to this debauchery of money is really returning to the fundamental insights of the gold standard. Gold has proven throughout thousands of years of history, universally throughout the history of this planet, the geological and civilizational history of this planet, to be the preferred monetary standard. There really are almost no counterexamples. If you look historically, the gold price relative to all goods and services has been remarkably stable. Because as we went from the gold standard up to essentially 1933, thereafter, we found that prices of gold fluctuated, prices of goods and services fluctuated, but the ratio of gold to the goods and services has remained a relatively constant number. When you have a gold standard, all you're saying is the dollar has a certain value, like a kilogram has a certain weight. It's a fixed measure. And so it doesn't restrict the supply of money. It simply means the money that is created has a stable value. Supporters maintain there's more than one way to operate a successful gold standard. All of these systems achieve sound money by keeping the dollar to gold price stable. A gold standard no more restricts the size of an economy any more than 12 inches in a foot restricts the size of a building you may wish to construct. Give a famous example from 1775 to 1900. The amount of gold mined in the world went up about three and a half times. The money supply in the US, which was on the gold standard, went up 160 times. So what does the future hold? A new role for the Federal Reserve? Cryptocurrencies? A return to a gold standard? At some point, point we are going to have to address this probably it will take another crisis but the clear answer will be monetary honesty and monetary stability but all this is the struggle for trust and money ultimately does depend on trust and when people have a belief an intuitive belief that the system is trustworthy and provides for this accumulation of knowledge and learning that is the essence of economic growth then trust will come learn more at inmoneywetrust.org Funding for In Money We Trust has been provided by the following. This program has been made possible in part by Mutual of America. Today is better because you've taken care of tomorrow. Mutual of America, your retirement company. Additional funding is provided by the Foundation for Individual Liberty, supporting a society built on capitalism and free enterprise. The Washington Examiner. Each week delivering news and commentary about the Washington political scene to readers nationwide.